All right, so this is The Earth and Its Peoples by Richard Bullitt, Chapter 26, Section 5, The World Economy and Global Environment. So the last section here, uh, 26-5, uh, just kind of a brief section talking about kind of the bigger picture of imperialism and what impact it had overall on the globe. Uh, one area of focus here is the economy. And a major change that takes place is the type of goods that are being traded around the world. Not only is there more trade, remember the Industrial Revolution. Gave rise to technologies like railroads, which made it increasingly easier. Uh, and things like steamships. So this allowed for more goods to be traded, but in fact, the types of goods that are traded are different. So typically, when we think about the global economy, maybe from about, I don't know, we'll just say 1500 to roughly 1750, they were typically goods being exchanged across the world that were very small in kind of size and weight, but very high in value. So things like sugar, spices, silk, these were what you would find most commonly traded on a global level. Uh, but after the Industrial Revolution, you know, 1750 till we'll just say 1914, you know, World War I, we'll just say that, uh, it's different types of commodities. These are commodities that are more related to industry. And these are commodities that are what we might call higher uh, volume and weight. You know, in, uh, you know, in, in these years, before the invention of the steam engine, it wouldn't make economic sense to try and trade something like cotton or timber around the world because those things were just too heavy and it took too long for commodities to go from one place or the other. But now with the industrial period, it's a lot more efficient and profitable for these kind of larger volume, larger weight things that are not quite as valuable. Uh, things like copper and rubber, these are raw materials or natural resources that are specifically tied to industry, right? Rubber used for the various sort of belts and, and different things regarding um, uh, machinery, uh, copper as well, you know, minerals and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, looking at this period, it's these more uh, types of goods that are being traded around the world. Another thing is the change in plant life, uh, global plantations. A plantation is a We'll say a plot of land to grow one commodity. That is essentially it's a designated area in which only one single commodity is grown. And uh, as a result of imperialism, things like coffee, rubber, and palm oil, uh, you know, there were plantations around the world. You know, pretty much wherever it was profitable to create one of these things where the climate was right. So, for example, coffee as a result of this global trade is grown in places like South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, places like Java. Same thing with rubber grown in South America, Africa, Southeast Asia, palm oil as well. So uh, and, and some of the environmental damages, you know, we sometimes call it you know, deforestation. That is this sort of slash and burn technique of cutting down the forest and building these plantations essentially so that they can be grown for export. One big difference too between the period uh, predecessing the age of imperialism is the emphasis on free trade, on capitalism. All right, this is a rejection. of mercantilist policies. All right, mercantilism said that colonies should only trade with the mother country. Free trade embraced by Britain and others say that colonies can freely trade with anyone. And so, you know, even government policies are encouraging more trade to take place than did in centuries earlier. As a consequence of this, there were also significant labor migrations. And again, the big key difference between the predecessing period and this period is the abolition of slavery. And so when slavery was abolished, you know, again, by the British and by other nations, the question was, well, who was to provide labor? 
So for example, in the British colonies following the abolition of slavery, many people from India, Africa, and China made their ways to various British colonies. You know, the Caribbean could be one of them, uh, but other areas as well. Uh, this was true for you know other areas, not just exclusively Britain, but Dutch colonies, French colonies. This was true of some American colonies like Hawaii, a uh, place like Hawaii. A lot of laborers from China and Japan came there. So you see a lot more migrations in search of labor uh, to replace this institution in slavery that had been abolished. Most of these individuals signed what was called, I guess, the contractions of labor. Oh, just contracts. Sorry, contracts of indenture. I don't know where that came from. And that was an agreement to work. And again, the time period differed. Could be five to seven years in exchange for the voyage. So for example, and this was common, a lot of British laborers, or sorry, a lot of uh, laborers from India went to the British colonies in the Caribbean. And the exchange was that uh, whoever was in charge of that economic venture would uh, provide the laborers with a contract. They would agree to work for five to seven years. And in exchange for that, they would be able to take the trip over to the Caribbean. So again, think about the new labor migrations in terms of replacing slavery. And again, people from within empires traveling throughout the world and settling in other areas.